Well, today we're doing a, a video on, again on the Union Oyster House. And you remember our first um, go was with the black and white or a grayscale. And in that uh, painting, we isolated maybe three or four values within to use within the whole painting. Um, the white, a light tone, a mid-tone, and a dark. And typically in any painting, the mid-tone is the dominant tone. So artists, when they're standing in front of the motif, they try to find that mid-tone and evaluate how dark it is, uh, how light it is, because that helps to um, set the scale that you're going to work with. And it gives you a clue as to uh, the sort of darks that you're going to need throughout the painting. Uh, in this particular scene, we're working from um, a view of the Union Oyster House. And uh, the, the scene uh, features the restaurant, which has a long history in Boston. It's, it's got some unique architectural elements. It's an old, in an old part of town, and a lot of uh, Boston's Former forefathers uh, sat in there and talked, ate oysters, whatever. So there's some history there, and it's it's sort of an iconic building. A lot of people know it. But the sunlight was falling at an angle and creating some really interesting shadows, if you remember our previous work. And uh, that's what we're going to emulate today. You can see here, I haven't really done any drawing. I've been building up the shapes with a combination of burnt sienna, a little bit of alizarin crimson, and some cadmium orange to give that um, glowing red color of, that brick presents when it's um, in the full sunlight. This is going to serve as a base, and uh, on top of this, once it dries, we're going to use some strong shadows to give us the direction of sunlight, the intensity of sunlight, the contrast that we need to make different elements stand out as well as to cast a long shadow across the ground. Uh, once the buildings are in place, with that uh, big sort of warm value, uh, I can relate the sky a little more accurately than if I painted it first. The sky in this case is uh, a little darker than usual, perhaps, because it's uh, making these these two buildings kind of glow in the in the sunlight so if we used a pale blue sky if it was painted with a lighter version it uh, the reds and the oranges would not have the same sort of warmth warm glow that they have um, when we put this deep cobalt blue next to it as i build up the wash you'll notice that i return to return to it. As it starts to drift down, I, I feel it's feeling flat. So I start to apply a little more blue to create some some depth up above. And this is something worth remembering because as long as the, the wash is wet, and by wet I mean glistening, you can change it. You can alter it and it's going to dry fine. You won't... Um, you don't really run the risk of making mud. As long as it's wet, you can play with it, lighten it, darken it, add a color, and um, refine the wash to your liking, and it's going to dry fine. So that's why you see me returning to the blue. I'm trying to get some, some depth to the sky. Uh, when it was drying flat, I felt I needed to punch it a little bit. So that, that blue is going to dry a little darker up in that spot up there and give us a little feeling of depth. Um, the, the light, I would say the light tones are in place and I'm starting to work in with some dark mid-tones now, uh, which represent either changes in color uh, in the wood facade or uh, dominantly the case um, shadows, dark shadows. The mixture I'm using is 
a blue and a brown. So some places I'm using a little more ultramarine blue, some places a little more either uh, burnt sienna or lizard and crimson. This is a, a good strategy when you're building a wash that's of any size is to find a way to change it as, as it moves down, as it moves left, as it moves right. And you can affect it in a number of ways. One is to change the color composition or the intensity. Now I'm putting in a, a real strong blue, which you will see um, unfold as the painting dries. That, that mark was a really strong cobalt blue. And it looks at this point like it's the same as the rest of the wash, but upon drying, there'll be a little more blue there. The same is true as we go lower. Uh, we'll add some more reds or possibly some neutral tint to affect this wash. And, uh, and um, continue to vary the wash. It's a good uh, working thought. I know that um, we're trying to reach the same sort of value, the same sort of darkness. And you can see a strong connection between these darks but varying the color makes it all the more interesting. Uh, carrying in some darks from the eaves above, this is a, a point in the painting where I have to slow down and I'm really trying to think like a calligrapher might think where I have one opportunity to make a stroke. I try to judge the angle and the, the, the um, point of start the point of stop and make that stroke unimpeded without any second thought and then move on. Um, the result of this is almost always positive. Even if the stroke is misplaced, the energy that's contained in those sorts of strokes that um, sweep across the page or give a real strong definition or shadow have a lot of power. And it's something we strive for in watercolor. It's one of the, I think, one of the um, little used beauties of painting is the power of um, the strokes. Um, sometimes we do blend them. When we have big washes, we need to blend our strokes. Other times when we're playing shadows as we are here, they can play a more positive and dynamic role they're descriptive, of course, but uh, in their own right, they have a certain character. And that, in the finished painting, you'll feel that. So the shadow is advanced now from the left side building, across the alley, behind the figures, up the right side building, and into the shadows. Um, remember, I'm thinking of this as one tone, even though I'm varying the color. Now I'm using quite a bit of blue and the, the shadow that's cast across the street below. And um, trying to wed that tone, uh, connect that tone to the rest of the dark so that it, it holds the painting together. It concentrates the lights where I want them to be bright and it, it creates sort of a frame for mid-tones and architectural elements and people and everything else. So it's very functional. It's not only descriptive, but it's functional in terms of the of pictorial language or the visual language. Once this midtone has sort of been established, I'm starting to get a feel for the, the finished product, and I can kind of see it in my mind's eye. And at this point, I feel I'm adding details that are going to uh, increase in awareness of that center uh, spot where I want to, want there to be a focus. It might mean putting a wash on the sign like I'm doing now. Uh, it might mean putting panes into that flat white square showing, a, showing us that it's a window. It might mean washing out some edges that are too hard and too um, abrupt so that I get more focus, more intensity in the street scene below. And there, there are a lot of potential distractions in this picture because it's so rich with architecture. The sign up above could easily dominate the painting. We love to see words, and when we see words in a painting, we almost always 
uh, want to know what it says, even if it's <laughs> backwards, as this sign is. We, it's, a, it's a traction. So I've kept it purposely um, light and plain, not to the point of distraction, but to the point that, you know, it, it'll be legible, but it won't take over the scene. And I'm, now you see me bringing my dark darks, the strong darks uh, under the canopy on the street, the entrance to the Union Oyster House, some shadows on the letters, shadows on the dormers that are up above into the window panes, etc. So you can start to see the finished product. Well, what I'm doing now, it may not appear clear, is I felt there was a this upper left side to be weak, a little weak. And um, there was a, a tree uh, where we were painting and the branches were hanging in such a manner. So I'm covering up a, a good chunk of that building and the whole left corner. Again, the point is not to necessarily paint everything that was in front of me, but to use that to uh, push in from that left side, that left upper corner, and to concentrate the energy in the lower third of the painting where the white figures are standing. This is the area that I would like you to look at and enjoy and, um, and um, follow in the finished painting. The um, everything else that is a potential distraction, the banners that I'm painting now, the uh, figures moving through the shadows, the balances up above, the lettering, um, are tried, I'm trying to keep them in harmony with the initial idea, which is the figures crossing the street and, and approaching the restaurant. So the shadows are in place. You can tell now those uh, calligraphic marks that were made do have the sort of intensity and strength that we were, that I was describing in terms of calligraphy. Uh, the dark shadow weaves throughout the painting, holding it together, and in fact creates the light that we see, the strong light that we see. So this is, I'm putting a few highlights to, to gain the figures uh, in the shadows and um, bring them out of the shadows, not to a point where they're taking over the painting, just so that we notice them a little more. And at this point, it's all balancing. I'm not adding really anything new, just balancing the painting.